Hello, uh, good morning everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining this conference. My name is Rita Secador Orvalho. I am a lawyer at PLMJ. Uh, Bruno already mentioned the importance of sustainability for our clients and for ourselves as lawyers of a, an independent leading law firm. Uh, we help them navigate with all the, the, the legal and regulatory sustainability developments. And uh, today I will be chairing this exquisite panel, really excited to do so. I want to thank the organization and Claire in particular for the invitation. And as I only have two minutes to do this introduction, I'll be really brief. Um, in this panel, Claire already mentioned that we will focus on the global expectations in relation to the, EU, uh, the draft EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence. Uh, it seeks to promote, I think we, we all know, but uh, going back to basics, it seeks to promote sustainable and responsible corporate behavior um, along uh, the global value chains by making companies identify, prevent, mitigate, or eliminate um, adver the adverse impacts of their activity on human rights and the environment. Um, also, the Portuguese Secretary of State for International Trade and Foreign Investment mentioned that although the directive uh, applies, uh, primarily applies to large companies, it has an impact along their supply chains and so also an impact, a relevant impact for um, SMEs. Uh, we will start this panel uh, with uh, Livio Sarandrea. Livio, he is a, the global advisor in the UN Development Programme for Business and Human Rights. Livio has a very interesting personal experience as an international human rights lawyer, and I am looking forward to hearing his keynote speech. Thank you. Obrigado. Um, Chairperson Orvalho, distinguished panelists, representatives from academia, the private sector, governments, civil society, law firms, and youth ambassadors. Uh, what a great idea, Claire, to invite you some about ambassadors today. <clears throat> I would like to stand by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for UNDP to participate in the third annual conference of NOVA Centers on Business, Human Rights, and the Environment, and contribute to the discussion on expectations for challenges, for, for expectations for and challenges in the implementation of human rights due diligence. The theme of this uh, event today is From Law to Practice. So I will focus my reflections on the second part, mainly the practice, or the practice so far, using lessons learned by my colleagues and I, working on business and human rights, and human rights due diligence in particular, in 36 countries in five continents. UNDP started its work on business and human rights nine years ago in Asia, a continent where, apart from Europe, we are witnessing, without a doubt, the, late, the fastest growth in embracing policies on responsible business practices. This is happening for a number of reasons, mostly important, in my view, for the inspiration and the pressure exercised by policy and normative changes adopted by trading partners, mostly in the Western world. This includes, of course, um, a number of, of legislations on mandatory human rights due diligence already adopted in several countries here in Europe, and indeed the upcoming uh, uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, CS Triple D, as it is more commonly known. I attribute largely to these developments the inspiration they encouraged Thailand, <clears throat> Pakistan, Japan, Mongolia, and Vietnam most recently to adopt national action plans on business and human rights. We are also expecting NAPs to be adopted with technical support from UNDP in the next six months in Indonesia, in Nepal, and Malaysia. There's also some initiatives happening for NAPs to be implemented, hopefully soon, in Laos and in India. 
So a lot happening indeed in the Asian continent. Importantly, in parallel to drafting the NAPS, Japan and India, and Claire already made reference to Japan, have adopted guidelines on business, um, guidelines for business on the content of human rights due diligence. <clears throat> Pakistan is also in the process of adopting one similar guideline. So we see a trend to go from NAPS, which is mainly a pillar one approach to it, if you want to use the UNGP title, to um, guidelines. We have more focus on pillar two on the human rights due diligence in itself. Two recent developments confirm a strong momentum for responsible business conduct in Asia. In the last uh, six months, Thailand and Pakistan launched with our help, feasibility studies to introduce, hopefully soon, legislation on mandatory human rights due diligence. So we see a clear trend on Asia working in the footstep of the EU in many ways. Also, very recently in Korea, a draft law on human rights and environmental due diligence uh, was, was brought in for discussion. So then we see in this case the trend of that holistic approach Claire was making reference to is not only about business and human rights, it's about business, human rights, and the environment. Now, as Asia took inspiration from Europe, developments in this part of the world are in turn inspiring countries in other continents. Developments in Europe and in Japan uh, have encouraged a growing number of countries in Africa and Latin America, which are hosting supply chains of large multinational enterprises of Europe or Japan in adopting also policies on business and human rights. We're very encouraged, for example, by progress made in the adoption and implementation of NAPS in Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, uh, very recently, Peru, where it was, the, the NAP was adopted uh, already I believe two years ago, but a lot of efforts are ongoing to implement it. And we'll hopefully see um, NAPS uh, um, adopted and implemented soon in Ghana, Tunisia, Mozambique, and Mexico. Now, alongside our support to governments, UNDP works very closely with businesses, directly with businesses around the world. In the last 12 months, uh, over 1,000 companies have attended our Business and Human Rights Academy. We train more or less 1,000 companies a year. And our interaction with these actors, which are ad admittedly belonging to a group of more committed companies, so they need to be seen as such, point to three interesting trends, which I want to share with you. Firstly, an increasing shift from traditional corporate risk management to a human rights due diligence process which focuses on risks to people and to planet, and not only risk to business. Secondly, a growing realization of the inevitability of human rights due diligence and mandatory human rights due diligence, whether directly or indirectly, as the Secretary of State was mentioning today, and indeed the advantages that will come as a result of a level playing field. Thirdly and finally, an increasing practice among some forward-looking companies to integrate human rights and environmental due diligence. Some of the multinational enterprises we have interacted with um, earlier this year, including Apple, Ikea, Bayer, Coca-Cola, have already made initial efforts to break silos between their teams working on human rights and those working on the environment. We had witnessed in the year before those two departments within companies working uh, in, in complete silos. We're seeing these silos being broken. Having focused on the glass half full first uh, in, 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 my, in my reflections, let me now turn to the glass half empty part. The contact of human rights due diligence is made complex, especially in developing countries. And once again, here I'm, I'm speaking as the main UN development agencies, is made more complex by three 
key challenges which we have observed at field level. Number one, though, as I said before, some good examples have emerged, the majority of businesses are still unaware of human rights due diligence and its four steps. According to the World Benchmarking Alliance, in 2022, 36% of the businesses assessed globally, and again, the World Benchmarking Alliance focuses on large businesses. They have large capacity in principle to do human rights due diligence. In this assessment um, uh, of all the businesses globally, 36% uh, scored zero on human rights due diligence with 87% of them scoring zero on tracking and 92% scoring zero on communicating. Second, where there is awareness, business lack an understanding of the technical details of the UN guiding principles and lack capacity. From a recent consultation uh, we had with 50 large businesses, we learned that for too many of them, Human rights due diligence is still a one-off assessment that does not involve affected uh, right holders beyond top-down audits. Thirdly, businesses from the global south, particularly SMEs, and again, we've heard today that not only businesses from the global south, but certainly even more SMEs from the global south lack the resources to meet human rights due diligence requirements of large economies and are expected to face more burden and marginalization in global value chains. A recent analysis of the implication of mandatory human rights due diligence provisions on developing and least developed countries highlights the risk that we constrain resources of small scale businesses, the new norms may result without a comp without appropriate, I should say, accompanying measures in their disengagement from international trade, a possible slowdown of socioeconomic development and increased vulnerability of local communities. I want to be unequivocal uh, in, in this point. We are very much in favor of uh, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive of the EU and all other mandatory norms, but we want to place an emphasis on the importance of accompanying measures when these uh, norms are adopted. UNDP is very committed to closing uh, the gaps that I've just uh, illustrated, gaps of awareness, capacity, and knowledge, and is engaging in the drafting of a few tools to respond to direct requests that we receive from companies that attended our Business and Human Rights Academy. It's one of the luxury we have to interact with companies, hearing from them uh, more specifically what they need and, and try to shape our programming around giving them what they ask for. And for example, last year we developed a guide on heightened human rights due diligence or human rights due diligence uh, uh, in conflict affected areas. My colleague Sinisha will tell you a lot more about that Later, we are also currently developing with the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, a guide on an integrated approach to human rights and environmental due diligence, pre uh, precisely to respond to that uh, growing trend, which we want to grow more on, um, uh, having an holistic approach to due diligence and an holistic approach to respect uh, for people and the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, as the world is off track to meet the SDGs by 2030, with two thirds of the 17 goals currently seeing limited or no progress, each of us in this room has a role to play in ensuring the respect for human rights uh, in business activity. Businesses are called to establish uh, on an, on, uh, an ongoing people-centered human rights due diligence process with direct engagement of affected rights holders. Uh, to use that um, approach, that win-win approach you was referred to earlier, and do the right and the wise thing. Governments are expected to develop a smart mix of voluntary and mandatory regulations 
and give incentives, something that I believe the ambassador of Canada referred to before, and which is something that I think is also important, incentive to set national standards of corporate behavior and make the business case for respecting human rights. Civil society and media are asked to continue playing the critical role as watchdog, but also reward human rights due diligence advances by businesses when they do take place. Through human rights education and independent research, the academia can build human rights due diligence resource base to inform national policies and legislation and corporate processes. Law firms can use the law to advise regulators on national human rights due diligence policies and legislations, and file legal complaints against businesses that fail to respect human rights. Consumers, again, referred to more than once today in a very important stakeholders, Youth, all of us can hold business accountable by monitoring them and making purchasing decisions consciously based on their human rights performance. According to uh, a survey that I found in my research, uh, that in, in, and, and I believe some other similar numbers were again mentioned by the ambassador of Canada today, uh, according to this global survey, 88% of consumers prefer to buy ethically sourced products, and, and by doing so, encourage business to, uh, to, um, to address human rights risks throughout their value chain. UNDP stands ready to work across all these stakeholders to support them in effecting playing their roles in human rights due diligence uh, at the country, at the regional, and at the global level. With this, uh, I wish you uh, a, a successful continuation of this uh, stakeholder dialogue. And of course, I remain available for any question and engaging in the discussion. Thank you and obrigado. Thank you so much, Livio. It was a, a wonderful overview on the, the recent trends and developments in human uh, uh, rights worldwide. Also helped broadening our horizons and a really interesting perspective on the glass half full, half empty. Um, dear panelists, um, we are starting with a kind of a different angle and a relevant insight into the CS3D and the energy transition. Um, we all know and understand we are undergoing a transition to sustainable energy, renewable energy mostly, um, in order to limit uh, global ch uh, climate change and uh, reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I have with me, we have with us today, <laughs> Anais Tabalagba. Anna is, she is a legal and policy researcher at RAID, a UK-based NGO. Uh, she has a lot of experience on the ground, uh, and she can, give her, uh, she can give us her views on the challenges in relation to energy transition, um, because we all know there are a lot of expectations in this regard. Anna is. So good morning, everyone, and thank you, Rita, for um, the introduction. So as mentioned, I work for a UK-based organization, which is called Rights and Accountability in Development. And RAID exposes corporate wrongdoing, um, human rights violations, environmental harm, especially in extractive industries in Africa. And in the past few years, RAID has been conducting extensive research, including field research, into the implementation challenges of corporate sustainability due diligence. And we've been looking in particular at the global supply chains of what we call critical minerals. Um, so these minerals are those that we need for the transition to green energies. So you've got, for example, lithium, which is obviously quite relevant in the context of Portugal, um, but also graphite, manganese, cobalt, um, and nickel. So these are the main uh, ones, although there's quite a few others that, that can make it to, to that list too. So when we as consumers think about the energy transition, what do we think about? 
we think maybe I'm gonna install a solar panel in my house, or I'm gonna buy an electric vehicle to contribute to decarbonization. And often we're made to think about the positive impacts that we can do as citizens, as consumers, without really thinking about the social and environmental costs of that, that transition to greener energies. And this is one of the concerns we raised in a recent research that we published um, at the end of 2021, but we've been doing a lot of advocacy around this, this work in the past couple of years. Um, and for that research, just to put things a little bit in, into context, um, we focused on cobalt as one of the critical minerals. And cobalt is quite interesting because it's one of the minerals that are essential for the lithium ion batteries that you find in electric vehicles. And as a matter of fact, about 50% of the global supply of cobalt is used in EVs, in electric vehicles. Um, the World Bank estimates that the demand on cobalt will skyrocket in the next few years. They're thinking about an increase of 460% um, by 2050, which is obviously a massive increase of the demand for cobalt. And at the same time, 70% of the global supplies, the global resources of cobalt, are based in an African country, which is called the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC. So in our research, we wanted to demonstrate that the extraction of this critical mineral comes at great cost for the environment, the health, and the lives of people who live in mineral-rich countries, and in, the, in this case, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So for our research, we interviewed, um, we decided to focus on labor rights, but there's a wide range of other human rights violations that happen in, in, the, cobalt, uh, in the cobalt industry. And we looked at the working conditions at five of the biggest industrial cobalt mines that operate in the DRC. We interviewed 130 workers, doctors, representatives of unions, and representative of labor agencies, or we call them as well subcontractors. And what we found was widespread abuse and human rights violations and exploitation of Congolese workers. And we really identified a wide range of human rights violations and labor rights violations. So that was, for example, very low pay, limited health benefits, um, excessive working hours. And in some of the mines, there was a lot of discrimination, racism, and violence against the Congolese workers. We linked these abuses to the extensive use by mining companies of subcontractors. So you'll tell me, you know, using subcontractors, it's not that much of a big deal, you know, everyone does it. But in that particular context, the huge majority of the workforce was coming from subcontractors. So in some of the mines, up to 70% of the workforce were contractors. And I won't go into too much details because I know that I'm, I'm limited in time, but basically, you know, if you rely mainly on subcontractors for your operations, you often need to pay them less than your direct employees. You have less liability under Congolese law because you don't have direct liability for your own employees. And these contractors are less likely to unionize because they've got no job stability, they just transfer from one employer to the other. So, you know, these are the things that really came out of the research when we spoke in particular with the representatives of uh, subcontracting companies. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to stop here for the, for the labor art issues. We are also working at the moment on a new project which is focused on the environmental impacts of cobalt mining and on the discrepancies between, you know, environmental expectations in the global north as part of the energy transition and environmental realities in, in the global south. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to say a little bit more about that later on if that's of interest. So I wanted to touch as well about how these human rights and environmental risks are linked to due diligence expectations. And the way we've thought about that question is tracing the cobalt from the DRC to the biggest um, electric vehicle manufacturers. And what was quite interesting is that, you know, these companies say that they source minerals responsibly, that they use clean cobalt. And one of the reasons why they're able to make these claims is in part, I wouldn't say that's the, the, the entirety of the issue, but in part is that they rely on voluntary industry initiatives to implement their due diligence responsibilities. And there's several issues, you know, with these industry standards. First, they're voluntary, which means that, you know, companies don't have an obligation to implement them or even an incentive to implement them in a way that's not just a tick box exercise, but in a real systemic, comprehensive way that addresses all the human rights issues that they can find in their supply chains. Second, some of these industry standards ha have very narrow definitions of human rights or environmental damage. And we really saw that in relation to um, working conditions because a lot of the companies that we spoke to were using a framework which is called the Responsible Minerals Assurance Process. And that process um, focuses on the worst forms of labor rights violations, which are child labor and forced labor, which means that, you know, when we think about the human rights violations that we identified, they don't fall into these categories. And as a result, they're just not looked into in mine site audits, for example. And we saw that because when we spoke to the EV manufacturers that we interviewed as part of our, of our research, out of 11 of them we engaged with, nine of them said that they had identified no human rights or labor rights violations in the entirety of their supply chain, which obviously is something that we, we um, disagree with because we've conducted the research at, at the source. Um, so quickly to, to finish, I, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting out of time, so I'm gonna go really quickly. Um, we've developed a few recommendations to address some of these concerns. So the first one is definitely stronger supply chain regulation, so that comes in part through mandatory human rights due diligence that's being implemented in different countries, but as well, you know, in, in the European Union. And I think, you know, th there's a lot of criteria that come into consideration, but for these laws to be really effective, they need to have a comprehensive understanding of human rights and environmental risks. And it's something that we've seen very much in the debates around the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, because until the, until the EU Parliament made an amendment, which was actually a very timid <laughs> amendment, um, corruption was not taken into consideration in the drafts. And that's a very serious issue especially in relation to extractive industries, because corruption and other, I mean, human rights violations and environmental damage are very much intertwined with corruption. And it's been demonstrated that corruption is more prevalent in extractive industries than in any other industries. 
So recently, we've seen um, the amendments made by the EU Parliament, a very timid mention of, you know, you can take into consideration corruption in your due diligence assessments. Um, and then I'm going to go very quickly with the, with the last two, but I wanted to touch on the directive. Um, we also believe that EV manufacturers and refiners should use their leverage on... Um, on their suppliers, and we know that they have some leverage on their suppliers, sometimes all the way to the mine, just because some of them have direct agreements with the mining companies, or, um, or you know, they're very involved in conducting uh, mine site audits, which is something we're advocating for. And finally, we believe that consumer-facing companies need to be more transparent about their supply chains, and that means mapping their supply chains all the way down to the mine sites and publishing these results. And this is really important for civil society and for consumers because it allows us to monitor the due diligence practices of the companies, but also as consumers to make more informed choices in our, in our consumption practices. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anais. It was useful. <laughs> Useful to further understand RAID's work and also the opportunities that consumers and regulators have uh, to contribute more to the su supply chain accountability. Uh, turning to Michaela, Michaela Steibold, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it the right way. Uh, she is a German lawyer and advisor at the German Help Desk on Business and Human Rights, which is a governmental consultancy that advises German German companies on implementing human rights and environmental due diligence. And she also works for the um, Responsible Contracting Project. Uh, Michaela, uh, what is the relevance of contracts and collaboration to optimize the supply chain? Could you please uh, guide us through the role of contractual clauses in helping to implement uh, the directive? Yeah. Um Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, as well, from my side. Um, I'm going to speak about the relevance of contracts uh, and code of conduct in implementing human rights and environmental due diligence processes in global supply chains. Um, the Responsible Contracting Project uh, is an organization that's aimed at yeah, designing, implementing, and creating awareness around responsible contracting practices. and. The role of contracts is a fundamental one, but how we're seeing it at the moment, the glass is not only uh, half empty, but almost completely empty, I would say, but I also show, I'll try to show how we can try to make it a little bit fuller. Uh, contracts play a key role. They're the legal links of the supply chain and they're used by companies to manage all kinds of risks. They're used to manage company risks, um, but the way they're being traditionally used is ineffective to manage human rights and environmental risks. And because of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence uh, regulation requiring human rights and environmental effectiveness, traditional contractual approaches become increasingly ineffective to manage company risks. Because of this type of legislation, these like human rights and environmental risks become company risks. We've heard about the change of perspective that this type of leg legislation forces companies to make. They cannot be used to manage uh, company risks anymore, and instead a new approach uh, to contracting is required. Um, contracts and code of conducts are by far the most widely used tool by companies to implement due diligence processes in global supply chains. Uh, they can be a fantastic tool. The way they're being used right now is the straight way forward to basically sabotage all attempts at conducting due diligence. And if you look at how traditionally contracts are designed, I think it will become very clear why this simply does not work. Uh, because we, we need effectiveness, which means we need to see results, basically. So traditionally, contracts, traditional contracts have... Um, yeah, three key features, which is they, they contain representation and warranties, um, they contain supplier-only obligations, 
and they contain contractual remedies that require a flow from remediation from the supplier to the buyer. And if we're now translating these three key criteria of traditional contractual approaches into, let's say, a high-risk con context like cobalt, um, you see immediately why this doesn't work. An actor, a supplier in a high-risk context who signs a contract or code of conduct where he guarantees that everything is fine, they manage not only all risks in their own operations, but also in their supply chain. This is not effective. This is simply completely unrealistic. Um, yeah. So um, one, one of the, the key features around the supplier is solely responsible means that only the supplier can be in breach of the contract and the buyer doesn't have any responsibilities in relation to the situation on the ground. So this is basically um, a, a contractual practice that is also termed as risk shifting because the obligation of responsibility of conducting due diligence is contracted away to another party, to the supplier, and leaves the sphere of, of the buyer. And um, yeah, risk shifting is, is ineffective. And I've also said it's sabotaging any efforts of due diligence and any efforts to reach effectiveness. And this is because these, these contracts, these like risk shifting clauses are usually combined with really hard exit rules. So it says like, you supplier, you guarantee that everything is fine, you manage everything. And then if I find the smallest problem, I reserve the right to terminate the uh, contractual relationship immediately. And this puts suppliers in a situation where they're basically in breach of contract the moment after signature. And this also leads to a situation where they have incentives to hide the situation on the ground because they fear maybe losing an important customer of theirs. Maybe they fear also other disadvantages from the contract. Maybe there's contractual penalties involved that would, again, flow from the supplier to the buyer. So no human rights remediation that should be flowing actually maybe from the supplier or buyer to the victims of the human rights or environmental um, violation and be used to remedy the situation. And so, um, yeah, it's sabotaging the situation. The buyer will do, e the supplier will do everything they can to hide the situation. And this is something where we need a shift um, because we need to, after maybe 30, 40 years of poor contracting and poor code of conducts, we need suppliers to understand that the times have changed. And what we want from them now is not to hear that everything is fine, but to actually hear how things are, to be then working on how we can make things so that they are fine. And um, from this, from these problems, we can derive a different approach to contracting. Um, what, what could be the key characteristics of human rights and environmental due diligence aligned contracts? And so this should be first that there's a joint obligation and a shared responsibility to conduct due diligence processes. So instead of the supplier guaranteeing everything, they should be yeah, share the obligation, do it jointly, and the buyer should be supporting the supplier in doing this. And then there should also be obligations of the buyer to support the supplier in, uh, not only in doing this, but also to um, show own uh, practices, especially purchasing practices that help the supplier in meeting standards. So one of the key, one of the main elephants in the room when discussing this with companies or at events is actually purchasing practices and the price. So nobody actually wants to talk about the fact that all of these things actually cost money and you can't just uh, continue business as usual and then have your nice due diligence process. You have just a managerial process, tick boxing exercise on top of your business as usual and then you can show that you have this nice process and things are fine because this is simply ineffective. So. Um, what you need instead is you need to change uh, purchasing practices. So prices must include all direct and indirect production costs, including costs for adequate living wages and um, sustainability costs. Um, yeah, lead times should be designed in a way that it allows the supplier to deliver without rights violations, especially violations of, of working time, which is often also connected to other problems, operational safety and health, and also connected to wages, because oftentimes overtime is not compensated for. Then we have a practice of last minute changes um, of orders, uh, of volumes, 
um, of uh, product specifications and generally an environment where companies rather have more short-term contractual agreements. So they place an order here and they place an order there. And this really doesn't put suppliers in a position where they could say, okay, I'm going to negotiate on a better price now because they have just this one order there. Uh, yeah, in, in a very competitive environment, maybe. So they're going in for low price, high quality, short lead times, um, and maybe also a tick boxing sustainability process on top of this. And um, only when companies start to have more long term engagements with their supplier, and we know from the experiences from the textile e sector that contracts of at least five years allow a supplier to plan enough to be actually investing in, uh, in improving standards. Just, I know I spoke to a lot, I got a sign. Just a couple last words in relation to um, this, what I've said not just being um, the dream of a couple of lawyers, scholars, um, but instead actually being a shared understanding that's also shared by the other organization I work for, the Help Desk on Business and Human Rights, the competent authority for the enforcement of the German Legislative uh, Act, the BAFA, and also the German government. So this, this understanding in relation to purchasing practices and contractual practices is actually shared uh, by the BAFA and is also something that at least in the parliament's position is very pronounced and is also interpreted into commission proposal and the position of the council. So um, this is something that is really far away from current business practice, but obviously if this already was standard practice, we wouldn't need any legislation for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Um, compliance is really more than ticking the box. It's doing it for the right reasons. Um, Carlos, uh, Carlos Martins Ferreira, uh, uh, he is the Group General Counsel at Jerónimo Martins, one of the largest companies in Portugal specialized in food distribution and retail. Uh, he has an extensive CV that, by the way, you can see at the website for the conference, the CV of all panelists is there. Um, Carlos, uh, Jerónimo Martins has over 5,000 stores, uh, thousands of suppliers, I can only imagine. Um, you also have a uh, geographical operation in several countries, uh, notably Portugal, Poland, Colombia. Um, how do you handle all of this in practice? Uh, how do you walk the talk? <laughs> of course. <laughs> And you have two. Thank you. First things first, I want to thank, of course, Nova School of Law, Nova SBE, and the invitation from Professor Claire Bright. To all of you, the audience, the youth ambassadors, I hope I will not be too dull. Uh, I am a lawyer, so <laughs> that risk exists. I just want to let you know. Um, uh, well, it's not easy to walk the walk. Uh, it's more or less inevitable because uh, one of the uh, initial aspects I would like to mention, I will not follow the PowerPoint uh, strictly, but uh, it's here for you to, to follow if you want to uh, deep dive a little bit on my considerations. Uh, 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 ESG uh, uh, factors in corporation, in management is inevitable. It's not just something good to have, is something that we must have. So Jerónimo Martins is perfectly aware of that. It's a company with more than 230 years of existence, so it has a long-term perspective of business, and of course, uh, in the last decades, it has incorporated a lot of what is now becoming a regulatory. It was self-regulatory, it was recommendatory or soft law, now it's becoming uh, hard law. Uh, it's inevitable. Uh, because, as I say here, it's no longer accepted that ESG uh, human rights have nothing to do with business if you have a triple bottom line approach. So planet, people and profit. Profit is important. 
uh, I apologize for being pedestrian, but uh, no money, no space travels, AKA no bugs, no bug rogers. So it is very important. Uh, uh, this triple perspective of the business, of the sustainability, incorporating all these factors is completely uh, uh, important. Uh, uh, so legal obligations are accelerating. You can't imagine the number of, of uh, laws, legislation, regulation that has been published recently is of course awful for uh, uh, general counsels and, and compliance departments because it implies to incorporate a lot of things in a very short period of time, but it's inevitable. Uh, I would like to start by, by telling you why uh, the companies, special companies like Sherry Martins thinks that there are opportunities in this regulatory agenda related to ESG, uh, CSR, uh, CSDD. Uh, uh, it was uh, already mentioned a little bit by the Madame the Ambassador from Canada uh, that uh, there are opportunities in developing this kind of approach. Uh, uh, it creates innovation solutions, uh, it reduces environmental and supply risks, attracts and retains employees, that is very important, especially today uh, uh, in our times, uh, where uh, employees are being missing, uh, expands consumer base, protects the brand value, reduces production costs. I'm running fast because I have very uh, <laughs> little time. Uh, generates positive publicity. Uh, uh, and publicity is not wrong. Uh, it's better to do the right things for the wrong uh, reasons than to do the wrong things for the right reasons. So publicity helps to differentiate from your competitors, allows you to define trends, improves financial performance, and of course, it makes easier and cheaper to access financing, and of course, it's the right thing. So uh, uh, that, that's, uh, let's say, the part of the opportunities. Where are the challenges? And here, also for the sake of time, I don't draw a distinction between legal and practical, despite the fact that uh, legal is very connected to practical. I mean, uh, uh, it's not only the gap between the law and the practice that we need to fill, is the gap between the law and what is possible to do that we have to feel. It's not the difference between what the law says, and what the companies do, it's between what the law says and the, what the companies are able to do. So here I'm uh, uh, referring to specific points of the draft uh, directive. As you know, we have, let us say, three different documents on the table that are being discussed in, in the trilogue. Uh, uh, between the Commission, the original proposal, the Council, the first position, and the, U the European Parliament, let us say, the second position. And it will be from this discussion that the final text will be adopted. And there are differences between the texts, which I do not refer specifically here, except when I deem it important to, 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 to refer. So, uh, the challenges uh, uh, for us as a company that is uh, uh, working and present in several jurisdictions, including several jurisdictions in Europe, not only Portugal and Poland, but also now Slovakia and Czech Republic. Uh, it's the absence of a single market clause in the, 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 the directive. Uh, we want to refer this. This was foreseen in the first resolution uh, of the parliament that proposed a directive in 2021. Uh, there was a mention to full harmonization clause there that is missing now in this new directive. It's a little bit dangerous uh, because if you want to ensure a level playing field, you need some harmonization that should be as, uh, let us say, complete as possible. Uh, the concept of the ultimate uh, parent company that has been introduced by the parliament in its position uh, to, to define the scope the subjective scope of entities obliged is a little bit complex and, and, and it is misleading because ultimate parent company uh, 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 refers to the concept of holding and financial holding. We don't want ultimate parents companies to have uh, uh, the, the duties under the, under the directive. We prefer to have the intermediate parent companies that have, let us say, the knowledge of the business that 
uh, perform actions uh, in the value chain or the supply chain to uh, have to adopt the, the diligence than just financial holdings that know nothing about uh, uh, the business. Uh, civil liability questions uh, of extraterritorial international private law, uh, the absence of a risk-based approach in the Commission proposal, contrary to the Council's and the UK uh, and the, the Parliament proposal, uh, that uh, uh, introduced the concept of prioritization based on severity and likelihood, uh, that seems to be the right approach. Uh, some definitions are quite obscure. The, 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 the difference between these concepts that, that seem similar but are completely different. Value chain and supply chain. Value chain refers to uh, 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 upstream and downstream. It includes not only your suppliers and your supplier suppliers, but also your clients, the way they use your products or the services that you render. That is very difficult to monitor. Uh, and to identify. So we prefer, uh, of course, the concept of supply chain or, as the Council introduced in its position, the, the concept of chain of activities. Uh, let me move fast because I'm being aware now that I need to move fast. Uh, due diligence obligations at group level should be uh, ended very carefully. Uh, uh, as I said, it is important that the intermediated parent companies are able to replace their subsidiaries uh, in order to congregate efforts and resources. Uh, the director's duty of care, uh, as it is framed still in the parliament's position, contrary to the council's position, may still cause certain paralysis of the decision-making process and uncertainty regarding the business judgment rule. Uh, uh, responsible disengagement should be very well addressed uh, uh, in, the, in the, the final version of the directive. It is important, as in the Council and as in the Parliament positions, contrary to the initial text of the Commission, to uh, avoid uh, suspension or termination of business relationships if the result of that termination is, let's just say, worse than uh, 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 the, the negative impacts uh, that we are trying to avoid or to mitigate. So we should avoid the kind of hands-off approach. Uh, you are not complying. I will terminate with you, and I will move forward. Uh, of course, that uh, uh, the deriving national legislation uh, of the directive should not put European companies at, let us say, a competitive disadvantage vis-à-vis uh, -vis more business-friendly uh, uh, legal environments. It is important to, to, it's not the major concern, but it's still a concern, uh, that also the driving national legislation should not discourage the investment in the southern countries, the so-called global south, uh, leading to what I call de facto embargoes. Uh, and now I'm not, I will finish just to saying why this is a huge task. Uh, uh, why this brings a lot uh, of concerns and congregation of efforts to companies like Jerome Marty. Because in practice, companies uh, within the scope of directive will be required to integrate due diligence into policies. So government is important. It's, it's the G of the ESG. That's, uh, sometimes it's missing. And it's not probably referred uh, 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 in such a detail that it should be in, in this direct directive. Identify actual or potential adverse human rights and environmental impacts, prevent, mitigate potential impacts, bring to an end or minimize actual impacts, establish and maintain a compliance procedure, monitor the effectiveness of the due diligence policy and measures, contractual provisions, we heard a lot from our previous speaker about this, uh, and of course provide support to uh, SMEs uh, uh, with which the company has established business relationship that is also important, and then publicly communicate on due diligence. So walk the walk is really difficult, uh, uh, more difficult than talk the talk, but uh, that's, that's a path that we have to follow, and the venue is clearly identified. Thank you very much for your attention, and I apologize <laughs> for the time Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I'm sorry for being such a, such a strict timekeeper. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no.
Uh, Nuno Moreira da Cruz is the Executive Director of the Center for Responsible Business and Leadership at Catholic Lisbon School of Business and Economics. Uh, the center is a catalyst for impact creation, uh, aiming to place responsible business at the core of the corporate strategy. Um, what is the main practical role of your organization and how does it deal with the directive? Okay, of course, no, no. <laughs> We don't have a space limitation, only a time limitation. Um, minutes on my way in, Rita told me five, so I'll do my best <laughs> to do it in three. Uh, first of all, I want to, I mean, I get invited a lot to do this sort of stuff, and I take normally these things very seriously, more so when the invitation comes from a competitor. So it's a pleasure as Catholic Lisbon to be here, and I will try not to disappoint you, Claire. It is a great event, and I'm sure, I mean, there is a lot of reflections that will come out of all of this to you. So let me position this as, as, as I go. I'm also a lawyer as a background. I have the first degree at Catholic Lisbon back a long time ago. And when, when, by the way, the, 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 the degrees were six years, believe it or not, six years of study to, to get a law degree. But I sort of very quickly got out of the legal ghetto and I went into business. So my life has been 35 years of business, right? So that's what I'm talking here. It's about business. And I have decently good news for you, which is, in most of the cases I've seen it, it's free. you call it from law to practice, I will argue that in many cases is from practice to law. Because there are a lot of companies doing for a long time now things that now are converted into law. You just need to think of all things like, for instance, Unilever 2010 with the Unilever uh, Living Sustainable Plan, where you are, they already had human rights and all that stuff. And so there's a lot of things that is happening in this, in this field. You know, when two great motivators in life are the stick and the carrot, you know that, right? So the stick is basically what we are talking about here, right? It's about the law, it's about regulation. I need to behave, otherwise I will lose my license to operate. I need to behave, otherwise I will be fined. I need to, to behave, otherwise in the extreme case I may go to jail. So that's the stick. I'm gonna talk about the carrot. I need to behave, otherwise I don't sell, which is a different perspective. One of the things that we clearly do at the center of responsible business and leadership that we created at Catholic four years ago is what we call the business case for action. Companies are not mother trees of Calcutta. Okay? Everything starts with profit. Carlos just said it. No profit, no concerns with planet and people. If there is anybody naive in the room, forget it. No profit, no planet and people. What is becoming abundantly clear is if you don't care about planet and people, you will not make profit, right? So this is the chicken and the egg, which makes the life of a business manager very interesting these days. You know, the times of Milton Friedman have long gone, the corporate social responsibility of a business to make profit, full stop. Yeah, I mean, the, the only relevance, the primacy of the shareholder is phasing out for a number of reasons. This, discussion of always between the short term and long term, the trade-off that needs to be done, what do I give up today to make money tomorrow, has two reasons, the planet and the people. And most of the big companies have already seen it. All with problems, and I teach every day, I teach Lisbon MBA, I teach undergraduates, I teach master students, and people of your age use, you are very, very critical, and you should with companies. But look at the history. What, what, and if I had time, if I did not have five minutes, I could take you through another thing. But let's leave it like that. Things are really evolving on that front. I have no doubt about that. Especially because most of the big companies see the, the things the way I see it, which is they don't believe in sustainability strategies. I don't believe in sustainability strategies. That's for the sustainability department. Sustainability is the strategy. Otherwise, it's bullshit. Otherwise, it's greenwashing. Okay? You need to take strategy, marketing, operations, human resources, 
in the same, at the core of the business. Because if you don't do that, you, don't, you, you are just playing with sustainability. And most of the big multinationals, and we recently did a study where we, we, we defined the eight big industries in the world. We went to see which is the market leader in each one of them, say, autos, Toyota, energy, BP, whatever, eight companies. And you look at the history of these companies, all with problems. They will always have problems, but the process is there and the, the progress is there. To, with a lot of things to be done yet, but that is there. So this business case for action is the first thing that uh, we, when we talk with CEOs, and I talk to CEOs all weeks, this is our first intention to try to, to, to raise awareness in our society. It's about business case for action. Of course, if you don't have a business case and nobody believes you, investors will not believe you, employees will not believe you, suppliers will not believe you, so you have to have a business case as any business case in a company life, right? So that's the first one. Second thing we do, sustainable development goals. The 17 SDGs that have been mentioned quite often today. The 17 SDGs, the companies have embraced them for two reasons. First of all, is a huge business opportunity. 10 trillion of business opportunities. Just think about climate action and renewables. Just think about water sanitation and everything that is going on in terms of uh, desanitization and things like that. So they're huge business opportunities. That's the first thing. But the second reason has to do with you. If you are not clear on the SDGs and your road to help the planet to survive or the people to survive within the language of the SDG, they will not attract and retain people like you. And that is very clear. There's lots of studies on that one. People to work for any sort of salaries anywhere, they will always exist. But the talent, and I see them at Catholic Lisbon, the talent will choose. And there are studies that say, in Europe, the study is European, says that you are ready to lose 15% of your salary to work for these sort of companies. So I have no doubt, the other day, two days ago, I just bumped in the, in the airport with a guy that is a very good friend of mine, which is an HR manager of a big multinational. He was telling me, no, no, these days, whenever I get to the short list of the three final candidates, these are the questions I have. Of course, they want to know the salary, of course. But the second question is this. So it's very clear for companies that they really need to, 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 to deal with these issues. Third issue, purpose. Purpose today is absolutely clear, critical, is mainstream in the life of companies. And there is a lot of confusion in the corporate world because between vision, mission, purpose. I mean, I see it very clear. Vision is where you're going. Mission is what you do. Purpose is why do you exist? Why do you exist as a company? What will the society miss if you fail? Why do we, the reason for existence, the French translate the purpose very well. They call it the raison d'être, and that's exactly that. So the reason to exist, other than profit, we know that the profit needs to be there. It's very engaging, aligns culture, and is really uh, culture motivated. The other day, because purpose, it gets into the nerve of culture. The other day, some, somebody was telling me something beautiful. I'll never forget. He told me, the best way to measure culture is to understand how an employee feels on a Sunday night knowing that he's going to office on Monday morning. Absolutely fantastic. And purpose helps to build a culture and then creates a competitive advantage. Because I mean, most of you that have not worked yet, let me tell you something. The most difficult thing to do in a company is to change a culture. The moment you have a strong culture impregnated with a DNA of purpose, then it's a sustainable competitive advantage, and sustainable in the sense that it, it lasts for long. Finally, and that's the fourth, and I will finish. Responsible leadership. Nothing with this will happen without responsible leaders. We've just conducted a study in Catholic to try to understand what is a responsible leader, and the five traits are very clear. If you want to know the five traits, you just go to the website of Catholic and you'll have the study there. And then we said, no, let's compare us to, with the Americans. And guess what? Exactly the same five traits. So responsible leadership is at the heart of everything. So I hope that you that are now about, about to get to, to your, start your careers, you can help us in trying to move this in a different direction because my generation is probably tall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nono. I will now give the floor to our youth ambassadors, which I welcome, uh, Dusu Jabula, uh, Luisa, and, um, Luisa Rocha and Luis Xena. 
um, you they will have dedicated time for Q and A, and then if we have the time, we'll open the Q and A to the to the room. I wanted to thank all of uh, all of the organizers and also the panelists and the chair for this uh, magnificent event. So I wanted to ask regarding business and human rights and corp corporates and enterprises, what is the focus on small and medium enterprises? Because we are too focused on big corporations and we forget about the supply chain that has a lot of small and medium enterprises. What will be the main challenges or what challenges do you see regarding SMEs? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one problem is one problem is that um, in supply chains of larger companies are small and medium sized enterprises whom we don't want to bother with these obligations. Legislators believe that they're too small to be maybe for now, maybe later it will change to be doing these processes. And some companies, if you talk about a 10-person enterprise, it really doesn't make any sense requiring them to conduct due diligence processes in their supply chain. And then really we need to look at, I've described risk shifting in contractual practices, and the contract is just a representation of what they're doing is an important operational document. So companies try to risk shift to their SMEs, to maybe SMEs or bigger companies in the global south. What we need instead is look at how can they be supported and empowered to be assisting the obliged companies in these processes. The BAFA, the German Competent Authority, and the Help Desk have uh, published a guidance on this topic called Collaboration in the Supply Chain. It's been out for a month now and is also available in English and contains lots of useful information on how obliged and non-obliged companies can collaborate. So maybe this is interesting to some of you. Okay. I also want to thank you all for your amazing presentations. And my question is to Anais. So uh, you mentioned a little bit about it, but I, I would like to understand that, okay, so considering that in many regions where the mining industries, they operate racism and, and other structural problems are, are deeply connected with those human rights violations, do you think the, um, the S, S CSDDD will be an effective instrument? Thank you. Um, it's it's actually an interesting question because um, so we didn't see discrimination, racism, and violence in all the mining companies. We saw them in Chinese-owned companies, and that's very reflective of the tension that have existed for a few years now between Chinese operators and Congolese populations. So. To what extent, you know, the, the directive will be um, effective in that context? I'm not too sure that it will, because a lot of the Chinese companies that operate in the region are potentially out of reach. Um, but you know, they they contribute to the general supply chains because. They mine the cobalt. Most of the cobalt is refined in China. There's only one big cobalt refiner in Europe, um, but all the other ones are, are Chinese companies. So, you know, a lot of the cobalt and other minerals that are mined by Chinese companies enter European supply chain. So there might be an indirect impact on these particular questions, whether that will be sufficient to tackle the, the specific question of racism and discrimination, I'm not entirely sure. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> once again, thank you all for coming and for your insightful presentations. Um, my question is to Nunu, but um, everyone else you can also answer. Um, my question is related to the, the to the argument of having a business case and that there is a business sense 
to having a more ESG driven approach because although that is true we have seen in the past few years some scandals of some companies that have been caught in greenwashing uh, and in summer and and in other well uh, practices that are not so sustainable and I would like to know well I, I would like to ask you why uh, why is there a certain level of resistance of doing it in the right way is it because uh, companies would have to do a lot of investments to be forcing profits or something like that? Sure. I mean, the big barrier is always costs and investment. Case. So it, that's why it's important to have a business case. If you if you have a business case, I mean, and you are law students, most of you, but business students will know uh, that, I mean, to make profit, you have three, po three possibilities. Either you sell more, higher price, or you reduce the costs. Most of the game for these companies is about market share is creating their brand reputation makes customers loyal to you, okay? So when companies uh, follow this route, they typically, and you think about the biggest companies in the world, they, this is the route they are following. So it's a question of understanding that I will spend the money, I will invest the money, because I will be successful, I will sell more. So that's basically where, where we are. Now, most of the companies uh, have a problem because they don't have the investment to do. The thing is that investors are changing. The, the investors themselves are requesting companies to act on a different way. And you have dozens of examples. And, and it same happens with the financial system these days. Yesterday I was talking to, the, to one of the CEOs. He was telling me, no, no, whenever I went to the bank asking for money, five years ago, it was all about, the only discussion was what's the guarantee for, for me to have my money back. That's now 50% of the conversation. The other 50% of conversation is the risks associated with ESG. I mean, for <laughs> another good example, the, somebody from the insurance company was telling me that for the first time they didn't insure a resort in Greece because everybody is telling them that in 10, in 10, 10 years, I mean, the resort will be under sea. So that th those are the risks that they see associated. So in a nutshell, they don't, they, you don't see more and more companies doing this because of investment, but I mean, the trend is there is no doubt the consumers most of the data that have been I, I have dozens of studies saying that I mean consumers investors they are all in the same place which is looking for a better world and companies know this especially the big companies those that have been around like Jerry Martins for 200 years they know that I mean with no planet no business if there are lots of social tensions and riots on the street there is no business and so these companies push the others into the right place and the value chain is critical there comments oh. um, I'm very skeptical of that and I'm really much in favor of binding legislation and just for some food for thought of why I'm so skeptical in relation to reputational risks um, many of you maybe remember the Volkswagen VW scandal in Germany 2015 was discovered that over 2.6 million cars in Germany were manipulated in relation to their um, nitrogen emissions 8 to 9 million globally and um, the uh, profits that Volkswagen made 2015, 16, 17, and 18 were record profits and were not the slightest harmed by this scandal. So it, I think it's something that's also changing. It, re it really depends on the market as well. Uh, and I hope we will see more of the change that you just described, but I would be a bit careful with that. Yeah, I, wanna, I wanted to come in also b b before... Uh, Michaela did uh, with uh, with the reflection, which is somewhere in the middle between the two points we just uh, heard. And, and in fact, I wanted to thank you, Nuno, for for a very motivating, inspiring uh, um, uh, reflections on the importance of business case. Uh, really, music to my ears. And indeed, the business case for business human rights is something that we have used a lot uh, in Asia, for example, where I spent most of my time. It is indeed a, 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 a point that has um, really uh, inspired and convinced many governments, for example, in the regions to come in. However, I do have to say that in certain parts of the world, more than others, uh, is already a reality. I mean, saying the things that you said here in Europe, um, talking to, um, to young people, to students, to consumers here in Europe, make a lot of sense, is making more and more sense in other parts of the world, but still, there are huge pockets of, of society and businesses in Asia and in Africa where 
especially among SMEs, the business case does not speak as strongly as it does here. But obviously, this, this is not to criticize your poll, because actually, in the, the second part of your intervention, you already gave the answer to that on how do we make sure that what we see here in Europe and what we've seen here in Europe, meaning the, 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 the uh, sort of bottom-up uh, approach on missing MRIs, the consumers, the society that is pushing the legislator, the legislator has and has made, is making the mandatory human rights due diligence process, we need to try to work and create uh, a similar scenario in other parts of the world, in Asia and in Africa. In fact, in Asia, we are starting a new project which we call informally bottom-up approach on business and human rights as opposed to the top-down work that we've been doing on national action plan, human rights due diligence, because it's not until we create that sentiment within the society, within the consumers, within the youth that demand companies to act responsibly, that the legislators uh, feel um, uh, that they, it is the right moment, for example, to adopt mandatory human rights due diligence, and then it becomes a widespread approach of all companies, including MSMEs, to look at the business case for it. So again, just wanted to make the point that, that the scenario that you presented is still incomplete in some parts of the world, and Europe is definitely uh, more advanced. Thank you so much for the final remarks. We have to end this panel now. We'll have a short coffee break outside and come back in a couple of minutes. <laughs>